Hi everyone, my name is Ovidu Katalin and welcome to a new presentation about uh, reproducing 17th century single lens telescope in the modern age. Starting from the early 17th century, the first telescopes were handheld. In addition, the observer will hold the telescope in their hands, try to find different terrestrial targets and also visualize different uh, celestial objects with this very tiny short focal length single lens refracting telescope. At the beginning of the 17th century many of these instruments suffered from many different optical aberrations and uh, the quality of the lens is not so good. Many of these lenses were reduced with an aperture mask. You can see here in the next slide an early 17th century refracting telescope you can see at the bottom left an image throughout this telescope and at the bottom of the image a wonky test. You can see the quality of the glass. It's not very good. Over the years these instruments became longer and longer so it was impossible to hold it in your hands. And the necessity of mounting these instruments on a tripod was very important. Now these instruments were designed using draw tubes, many draw tubes mounted on a straight board that is designed to actually prevent the instrument from bending and also the tubes to be well straight and the optics aligned. And this design covers uh, a range of instruments starting from focal lengths of 1.5 meters going up to 4 meters long. These were very unwieldy telescopes because longer the focal length, greater the vibrations will be. And the actual instruments, uh, longer than 1.5 meters, will be very difficult to use. These instruments uh, going up to 2 meters long and 3 meters, 4 meters with this example. The actual instrument, the telescope tube will bend under its own weight, but this is not the only problem. The tripod is very, very tiny in comparison with the length of the telescope. This was a very great problem in the 17th century. Not only in that time, I have experimented with these kinds of instruments and I can say that longer than 1.5 meters, the instrument is useless. Now. The only solution is to mount the tube on a two-point system mount. This involves a two mounting system, one in the front, close to the middle of the scope, and one at the back of the instrument. You can see this example at the Paris Observatory in the middle of the 17th century. Now, how this system worked? You have a staircase or something mounted in the front of the optical tube, so that you can point the telescope towards the target you want to see, depending on the position in the sky. You can lower and heighten the optical tube. You can lower it down and uh, raise it up towards the object you want to see. And uh, at the bottom of the optical tube, in the lower part, you have a system that, that actually works the same. You can lower and uh, raise the telescope up towards the target you want to see. It's very simple if you think about it. So these instruments longer than 1.5 meters going up to the maximum length of 3 meters can be mounted on the system. Now different instruments were mounted on a very strange type of uh, mounting system called the balancing point. You have a rope that balances the instrument and the observer would try to hold the instrument in their hands. This is a very strange type of mounting in the early 17th century and going up in the middle of the 17th century. You suspend the telescope on a pillar using ropes and try to find a balancing point and hold it in your hand and try to visualize different objects in the night sky and make terrestrial observations. You can see in these illustrations. Now comes the complicated design of Hevelian instruments. So longer the focal length going past 4 meters it's going to be very complicated to mount this telescope on a two-point system. So you need ropes and pulleys and different systems to actually hold the instrument from bending under its own weight. 
So this is like a two-point mounting system. You have a pole in the, at the middle of the instrument that uh, holds the actual optical tube assembly. Uh, under the telescope it's a board that holds the entire instrument and uh, at the back of the telescope it's a table with a frame that uh, holds the actual instrument and using this mounting system at the lower part of the telescope you can lower the instrument and uh, move it up and down left and right and try to track the object in the night sky so this is how this instrument work these uh, telescopes uh, were mounted in this configuration starting from let's say uh, five meters going up to 150 feet or 45 meters long the most largest instrument ever made this is a very complicated system that uh, uses uh, ropes and pulleys to actually stabilize the instrument but the uh, longer the telescope gets the harder the instrument will be to use and to point it towards uh, the actual object you want to see now at 45 meters long this instrument is impossible to use even the slightest gasp of wind can cause serious vibrations and uh, this is the limit of telescope construction now there is two types of these instruments closed tubes and uh, open tubes open tubes like this one with baffles instead of the optical tube and this is a closed tube you have many segments of tubes mounted together and the open tube design using baffles for eliminating straight light this is uh, the actual instrument that Hevelius made you have the closed tube and the open tubes all these instruments are uh, used uh, by astronomers in the 17th century now we're going to talk about uh, modern replicas of 17th century telescopes and starting with Mircea Piteancu one of the most greatest amateur astronomers in Romania and his single lens short tube Keplerian telescopes you can see here these great instruments tiny telescopes for uh, visual observations also deep sky planetary observations this is one of the most interesting replicas he made and these instruments are very attractive they look very similar to 17th century telescopes and I really love their design you can see one of them in action this is the 25 millimeter aperture 1 meter long focus refracting telescope that Mircea built using a cardboard tube and an eyeglass lens at the objective also the eyepiece is probably Huygens or Kepler now these instruments were very common in the communist era because the resources were very limited so many amateur astronomers built they actually built this kind of instruments in the uh, 80s or the 90s this is the original telescope and now we can see observations with the tiny Keplerian telescopes 50 millimeters aperture at Jupiter double stars and different celestial objects with these tiny telescopes only 50 millimeters in diameter so you can see many different stuff with these kinds of instruments especially on a dark sky messy objects and uh, globular clusters and uh, open clusters these are drawings made by Mircea with his tiny telescopes, quite impressive. Jupiter, you can see the moons, quite uh, remarkable with a 50mm aperture, very short focal length. Now you can see Jupiter with a 1 meter long telescope. Beta Cigni with this instrument. Very interesting drawings with this. Uh, kind of instrument using eyeglass lenses sunspots Venus and Jupiter quite impressive to actually draw these objects and especially Saturn now we're going to talk about the Martin single lens telescopes this is the actual instrument that he built using surplus lens glass 30 millimeters in aperture 1 meter focal length with a surplus 
a plano convex lens, cardboard tube mounted on a tripod, you can see the objective lens is a plano convex lens, the lens cell is made out of cardboard, you can see the board uh, for uh, actually stabilizing the instrument when using astrophotography, but this instrument at 1 meter focal length is good without a board, you can see the moon with a 30 millimeter aperture, the chromatic aberration is too big, a 25 millimeter aperture would be great for a 1 meter long telescope, you have a 1.5 chromatic coefficient, similar to 17th century telescopes, you can see the sun, sunspots, the moon, different drawings with uh, these instruments, double stars, this instrument is quite remarkable because uh, even comets you can see he reduces the chromatic aberration with an orange or a red filter and now this is the 50 millimeter 2.5 meter long single lens telescope it's a very big telescope 50 millimeters aperture is quite big for a 2.5 meter in addition at its focal length you need a 40 millimeter aperture to reduce the chromatic aberration and this is the actual objective lens from Opto Sigma. Now we're going to Fabio Arpino Singlet Telescope. This is the actual instrument that he built uh, many years ago, a 40 millimeter, 3 meter long telescope mounted on a tripod. And this is the 35 millimeter, 2.1 meter single lens telescope. Every single thing here is homemade. The objective lenses, the eyepiece, the mounting, the tube, everything. Now we're going to talk about making the lenses. And now this is the process of rough grinding a plate glass that he uses. He cuts window glasses and I don't know if he tests the glass before grinding for checking the actual quality of the glass before starting the grinding process. And now this is the actual process of making the radius of curvature of the lens to the desired uh, focal length you need. So. Uh, it's very interesting to actually grind your own lenses and make the instrument from the bottom, making the lenses, the eyepieces, the tube, the mounting system, absolutely everything. This is the fine grinding process after the rough grinding. Everything here is homemade. This is a tool made for fine grinding, also by Fabio. I really love uh, when he made these incredible unique lenses. This is the final stage with the fine grinding with very fine powders. And now this is the finished lenses after fine grinding. You can see how beautiful the lenses are. And the tools required for this process are homemade. You can see the grid and the tools and the lenses. And the actual lens after the rough grinding process. Quite remarkable. After rough grinding, it's important to check the radius of curvature with a spherometer to see how deep you grind or how far you go. And uh, if it's not enough, you need to grind it again and uh, until you hit the desired radius of curvature for your focal length. And now this is the polishing stage for the actual lens to make it transparent again. You can see the actual tool for polishing. This is all handmade uh, tools and uh, techniques. And now the finished product, the actual objective lens, completed. This is the 25mm 1m look focus cardboard tube refracting telescope on a wooden mount. And these are images throughout this instrument on Saturn, Jupiter and the Moon. Quite remarkable. You can see the bands of clouds on Jupiter and details on the Moon's surface with just 25 millimeters of aperture and 1 meter focal length. Saturn and Jupiter, you can see these uh, remarkable images and airy disks of relay lights far away in the distance with the 25 millimeter aperture and the gap between the planet Saturn and its rings quite remarkable and this is a test of the 40 mm 3 meter long objective lens this is the moon with a large 40 mm objective 
and uh, we're going to talk about technical problems with these instruments now these telescopes are very long and uh, the only problem is that these instruments these tubes are mounted on a tripod on an equatorial uh, mounting system this is actually aluminium tubes and at the bottom he inserts a PVC pipe a tele-extended tube for the eyepiece the problem is over time these tubes can bend under its own weight also the vibrations are very strong because there's nothing holding the actual optical tube there's no boards underneath so the vibrations are very high Fabio actually put counterweights at the middle of the tripod for stability but you can imagine this tiny tripod and a very long aluminum tube can cause serious vibrations on a windy day. The solution is to actually mount these instruments on a two-point system for stability. Because the instrument is sitting on a two-point system, the actual weight is distributed completely so the tube cannot uh, deform under its own weight but if you mount a two meter long telescope on a tripod over time you can have serious problems but a one meter telescope it's no big deal you can mount a one meter telescope on a tripod it's a small instrument a very short focal length and a tripod can hold this kind of instrument without bending the optical tube over time he made even the eyepieces himself quite remarkable This is quite a very interesting uh, setup for a 17th century telescope to have built all of this by yourself. Now Zookeeper Game on Reddit made a very long telescope by himself using plate glass, grinded by himself using only plate glass, 60 mm in diameter, grinded and polished by himself. The actual Diameter of the lens is 60 millimeters and the aperture used is 40 millimeter and the focal length 4.2 meters long. This is the eyepiece, 25 millimeters in diameter and 50 millimeters focal length. Plate glass, the same thing. Only two lenses, one lens in the front, the objective, and the last lens. Only a single lens at the eyepiece at the back. Only two lenses for this monster mounted on a Dobsonian mount. You can see this huge cardboard tube telescope mounted on a board and on the Dobsonian mount. All of this is uh, mounted on a table. This is quite a shaky instrument and the actual cardboard tube can bend over time. You can see the mounting system. The problem is that these tubes, these cardboard tubes are very, very sensitive to humidity. And now this is the moon with this instrument at 84 magnification. You can see many details. It's a smartphone picture at the eyepiece. I remind you that the eyepiece is a Kepler eyepiece, plano convex lens, and the objective lens is still plano convex lens. Both of them are the same type of lenses at different focal lengths. But the objective lens is the most important lens that gives a 4.2 meter long focal length for this telescope. The only problem is the mounting system that he uses at this long focal length. The tube is very long and the cardboard tubes can uh, have problems under humidity and the solution is to mount this telescope on a Hevelian system using ropes and pulleys, not a single mounting system. On a straight board, this is the only solution in my opinion for these 4 meter long telescopes. Now we're going to talk about Alan Binder, Hevelius replica, one of my favorite telescopes made in this configuration using a Hevelian type telescope with ropes and pulleys suspended on a high pole and a mounting system at the back of the telescope using a table and a system that uh, moves the instrument left and right up and down to point the telescope towards the objects you want to see so this instrument is quite large it's like a two-point mounting system but with ropes and pulleys to stabilize the optical tube and this configuration is huge 
The problem is when you try to raise it up. Now we see the monster Hevelion telescope, and besides, we can see Hevelius watching the raising of the 150 feet long telescope, the 45 meter long instrument. This is a huge telescope, you need assistance and workmen to actually raise and assemble the telescope to the desired position you want to actually see. If the object is high in the sky, you need to point the telescope toward the objects and then make fine adjustments at the back of the telescope with that very sophisticated mechanism for pointing and following the objects in the sky. You can see Hevelius himself making observations with his huge telescope. And now we're going to Alan Binder, 17th century replica, his favorite instrument. This is the uh, the whole Helvelius telescope that Alan built. This is his favorite scope. So, this is the uh, Helvelius telescope right, right here. here we go. You can see this wonder replica. All of this instrument, all the parts of this instrument are homemade. The objective lens, the eyepieces, the mounting system, the pole, the back end of the telescope where you actually point and make fine adjustments you can raise the telescope up you can see a boulder for stability at the bottom of the pillar all of this assembly is made by alan and it's quite remarkable to see this instrument in all his glory you can see the back end of the telescope with that frame you can lower the frame up and down you can see the tube sitting on the frame and you can move the entire assembly left and right to track the object. You can see the objective lens and the eyepieces. All of these eyepieces are homemade, Huygens type eyepieces. The micrometer, it's uh, made by Alan himself using a Kepler biconvex eyepiece. And now we can see drawings of Jupiter throughout this huge instrument. You can see the shadow of the moons of Jupiter, details on the bands of Jupiter, the shadow of the moons. You can even see the great red spot, but you cannot observe it in these uh, uh, drawings. Mars, the surface of Mars, the polar caps of Mars, you can see. This is quite remarkable with this single lens telescope. It's just a single lens, 72 millimeters in diameter and a 5.2 meter long focal length. And the Orion Nebula, quite remarkable and absolutely beautiful. Now we're going to see Robert May 17th century style telescope. Watch this video. <laughs> Okay, I'm Robert May. I'm from San, San Marcos, California, San Diego area. This is my 200 inch refractor. This is a 17th century style instrument, so it's 200 inches because that's the way they measured instruments back then. And I did this just as a uh, lark to find out what the astronomers back in the 17th century actually saw through their instruments. And I'm amazed at some of the things they saw and other things I'm not amazed. But it's a four and a quarter inch, 200 uh, inch focal length, which runs out to about five uh, f45. And I ended up making the eyepieces too because they're uh, to get the field of view. I needed to have a uh, three inch diameter eyepiece, and so I made a set of eyepieces big enough to where I could see the whole moon or the sun without having to move around. And that is a telescope. A big boy, you're, you're going to track for maybe uh, uh, 20 minutes or so. Then you have to pick up the table and move it and start all over again. I really love the whole craftsmanship of this instrument. The aperture is quite big, but I think he reduces the aperture with a aperture mask and uh, using a 5 meter long uh, focus you need a 60 millimeter aperture but uh, overall this is a quite a uh, impressive telescope the mounting is perfect for a five meter long telescope using a Hevelius style instrument and the uh, optical tube everything is made by Robert so the whole instrument is homemade 
uh, you raise the telescope up and down and you move that table around and track the object. Now we're going to move to a great replica from Descartes movie in the 70s, a Portuguese movie. This telescope is a one of a kind, a quite a remarkable replica in function, so it works. I don't know if the telescope exists today, but I think you want to see this actual movie scene with this instrument right now. Osservate, è uno strumento delicatissimo ed è possibile muoverlo in qualsiasi direzione. Senza alcuna oscillazione. Al calar del sole inizierò le mie osservazioni. Signori, il cannocchiale ci ha svelato i movimenti dei cieli. Come dice Bacone, l'uomo è ministro e interprete della natura ed egli può comprenderla soltanto osservando attraverso l'esperienza e l'intelletto l'ordine di essa. Egli non sa nulla di più, né potrebbe sapere di più. Nulla, veramente nulla. Ed è l'ignoranza delle cause che ci toglie la conoscenza degli effetti e ci impedisce di agire sulla natura secondo le sue leggi e quindi ci impedisce di assoggettarla a noi. Anche questo è un pensiero di Bacone, perché non si vince la natura che obbedendole. E quando ignoriamo le cause, le nostre spiegazioni dei fenomeni naturali nascono dalla nostra fantasia e Dio sa quanto la nostra fantasia sia fallace. Ogni secolo ha le sue mode, ma poi le mode passano e il mondo rimane sempre lo stesso. Ho molta ammirazione per voi, astronomo Ciprus. Siete il più esperto astronomo che io conosca. Non ho mai sentito parlare di questo signore. Un presuntuoso che quando vide attraverso il cannocchiale il vero disegno dei cieli rimase turbato perché ciò che vedeva non corrispondeva ai disegni degli astri che aveva studiato sui manuali. Scrisse allora a Keplero che il cannocchiale quando viene rivolto alle cose terrestri fa meraviglia. Esso ingrandisce gli oggetti e riesce a scoprire tutto ciò che si vede a occhio nudo, ma puntato verso il cielo non serve a nulla. Io approvo le teorie di Keplero, ho verificato molte delle sue osservazioni e ho rifatto molti dei suoi calcoli. Se non fosse morto due anni fa, sarei andato a trovarlo a Lisbona, dove si era rifugiato a causa delle guerre di religione, per ricevere la sua approvazione. Le orbite dei pianeti sono delle ellissi di cui il Sole occupa uno dei due fuochi. Quando Keplero fece i primi calcoli, traendoli dalle osservazioni del suo maestro Tico Brahe, commise solo un errore che poi del resto corresse. Scambiò le ellissi per degli ovali. L'idea genialissima di Keplero fu quella di rappresentare le osservazioni sul corso degli astri come si sarebbero potute rilevare osservandoli dal Sole anziché dalla Terra. Egli calcolò in 687 giorni il percorso intero, cioè la rivoluzione di Marte, lungo la sua ellisse attorno al Sole. Risolvere, rivoluzionare, significa ritornare continuamente al punto di partenza. Alla fine di ciascuna ellisse, infatti, il pianeta ritorna nell'identico posto del cielo. Questo posto e il posto del Sole sono i due punti fissi ai quali egli si riferì per poter determinare la posizione della Terra. Con questa specie di triangolazione dei cieli, Keplero è riuscito a calcolare il percorso di ogni altro pianeta attorno al Sole, la velocità e le distanze tra i pianeti. Questi studi sono di grandissima importanza. Per esempio la Terra ci appare molto più grande di tutti gli altri corpi celesti e la Luna e il Sole ci appaiono più grandi di tutte le stelle. Ma se noi correggiamo il difetto della nostra vista per mezzo di ragionamenti geometrici, che sono gli unici ad essere infallibili, noi ci renderemo conto che la Luna è lontana da noi, diciamo, all'incirca 30 volte il diametro della Terra, ed il Sole 6 o 700 diametri. E confrontando queste distanze con quello che è il diametro apparente del Sole e della Luna, troveremo che la Luna è più piccola della Terra e che il Sole è molto, molto più grande. Avreste per caso anche voi l'intenzione di aggiungere qualche nuovo pianeta a quelli già conosciuti? Vedo che anche voi vi siete lasciati eccitare dalle mode degli innovatori. No, io non sono un innovatore. Cerco semplicemente di riuscire a scoprire con assoluta certezza il vero volto dell'universo. Spero che vi sarete almeno reso conto che l'universo è immenso. E il suo vero volto è molto lontano da voi. In attesa del buio, scaldiamoci ancora con del cioccolato. 
E adesso, signori, vi mostrerò qualcosa di meraviglioso. Dirigerò il cannocchiale verso le Pleiadi. Spengo la lucerna. Ecco, signori, ammirate le Pleiadi. Devo ammettere che funziona. Le meraviglie dei cieli. Come è basto il cielo? Now we're going to talk about Mr. Mao Saito Hevelian Telescope Replica and this is a replica made by students in 2004 using Mr. Mao Saito Help a 10 cm telescope with a focal length of 10 meters long. We can see Mr. Mao Saito with a replica of Hevelius Telescope the mounting and the actual instrument is made by him all of these instruments are at the Kawaii farm in Japan it's a tourist attraction and, and you can see many instruments here with different uh, aperture and focal length. All of them are Hevelian types telescopes with uh, baffles instead of an optical tube. There's no optical tubes here. Everything is uh, open tube design similar to Hevelius and the mounting system everything is a replica of uh, 17th century style instruments. I really love the craftsmanship of these instruments. There are quite remarkable copies of 17th century style Hevelius telescopes. And now we are heading to the largest telescope in the world, the largest replica of Hevelius telescope, a 21 meter long telescope with an aperture of 150 millimeters. This is the largest telescope in the world, the largest replica of 17th century telescopes in Japan. This instrument uh, is quite remarkable and you can see the erecting of the telescope. It's made out of boards, segments, that are assembled at a site, so it's a team effort to actually assemble the telescope. Instead of an optical tube, there are baffles to reduce the unwanted light or the parasite light in the optical system. These boards are assembled, so it's not an entire long straight board. These are segments that are assembled and uh, put together and the instrument raised up, assembled and uh, connected with uh, ropes for stability and to prevent the optical tube from bending under its own weight. So these ropes are essentially designed for the instrument to be collimated or in a sense balanced and uh, straightened so that the actual instrument cannot bend under its own weight. This telescope can be used for making lunar and planetary observations and many types of bright objects in the sky and I'm very curious how this instrument performs on double stars. This, uh, in this telescope is mounted at the middle on a board, you can see uh, the support system under the telescope and at the back of the instrument there is a table with a frame uh, with a design that can be used to maneuver the telescope you can see in the right the actual system for uh, tracking uh, the object in the sky that frame can move left and right up and down so from there you can actually adjust the telescope all of these ropes are designed to stabilize the telescope and prevent the optical tube from bending. The baffles are very carefully cut. The large baffles are close to the objective and as you, as you go towards the back end of the telescope the baffle apertures become smaller and smaller. So you ended up with a very uh, interesting system that uh, eliminates uh, the unwanted light. So it's like a closed tube. The other types of uh, Hevelian telescopes are found in Japan. We are trying to visualize other replicas. And this is a very long 6-meter telescope 
with probably an aperture of 70 mm in diameter, an open tube design with baffles, the same deal, another instrument, you can see the actual baffles that are uh, positioned so that you can eliminate the unwanted light. These are, this is probably the best design for this very long telescope, so you can see another instrument, 50 mm aperture and a 4 meter long focus, a very great design for stability. At 4 meters long it's a great solution to actually prevent a tube from bending. The open tube design is very good because if you have a closed tube it will cool down slower so the cooling process with an open tube is very fast, almost instant. It's a very good design and the instrument is portable because the actual board can be made out of segments so you have at least four segments that can be assembled and you can see a large instrument 80 millimeter aperture a 5.5 meter long focal length and you can see here small instruments aerial telescopes with baffles with small apertures another replica with a closed tube design these instruments are huge and the only solution for uh, an instrument that has a focal length of four meters or three meters up to maybe 21 meters long is to have an open tube design with baffles. All of these telescopes are homemade and probably even the objective lenses and eyepieces are homemade. The optics of the 21 meter telescope are made by an optical company and the lenses are diffraction limited. This becomes a tradition in Japan to make 17th century style telescopes. There are quite uh, interesting to use and uh, very attractive instruments. My dear friends, we are changing the subject and talking about technical problems with these instruments. The lenses used in uh, single lens telescopes. The worst lens to use is meniscus or eyeglass lenses, also called convergent lens. You can see a star test at the top using a biconvex symmetric lens and at the bottom you can see the eyeglass lens test on artificial star. You can see the distortions of the lens and the iris disc. This is a ronky test with a simple meniscus subjective lens. The distortions are very strong in the middle. You can see the bulge caused by the shape of the lens. And now you can see a star test in the far distance using a biconvex symmetric lens. The every disc is very good and now the actual meniscus lens comes into view. The every disc is distorted and uh, these are strong spherical aberrations caused by the meniscus lens. You can see the spherical aberrations getting bigger and you can actually view in the left and the right different tests at 28 millimeters now the biconvex lens these spherical aberrations are cancelled using the biconvex shape so this is a test with a plano convex lens the best shape for 17th century style telescopes and now the biconvex lens comes into view the, the actual difference between Plano convex and biconvex are very little and now the meniscus lens has the most distortions has the most uh, excessive spherical aberrations this is a test with a biconvex lens you can see the spherical aberrations are very small and now the actual meniscus lens comes into view the spherical aberrations are strongest uh, 130 times bigger than the biconvex lens at the same aperture and focal length and this is a test a star test with a biconvex symmetric lens intrafocal and extra focal on an artificial star and now we're talking about the tube and the mounting technical problems i have made a 35 millimeter 2.1 focal length telescope using segments of cardboard tubes 50 millimeters in diameter on a board on a straight board and this design was a failure because the telescope needs to cool down and because of the humidity the actual telescope induces astigmatism in the system so you need to rotate the tubes and the objective lens this is the straight board with a channel at the middle to actually level the optical tubes the shakiness of the telescope is very big it's a very long telescope but the problem consists in the design the cardboard tubes are not so good for this type of telescope 
but it's good and uh, perfect for small focal lengths up to 1.5 meters long mounted on a straight board. This solution is very good for small focal lengths, but uh, not so good at uh, long focal lengths. So mounting a 1.3 meter long telescope on a board and then on a tripod it's a very good solution because uh, it's a very short focal length and many of these distortions are cancelled as the focal length getting are getting the shortest and one meter telescope you can mount easily on a tripod and starting from 500 millimeters going up to one meter it's very simple to mount the entire assembly on a tripod directly without a board so uh, these solutions are very good with uh, short focal lengths. Going up to long focal lengths the problem they are getting uh, extremely complicated and there are solutions for these problems to mount a telescope on a two-point system because uh, it's uh, very long and you need stability to actually prevent a tube from bending under its own weight because if we have a segmented tube it's still you have the same problem but if you have a very long single tube it's getting very complicated to actually mount this on a board and uh, try to observe it because the actual length is so huge that uh, if you touch the instrument you cause very powerful and strong vibrations on the entire instrument because you only have a single point of mounting but mounting the telescope on a two-point system one in the front and one in the back you stabilize the tube and this is a good solution starting from uh, 1.8 uh, meters long going up to approximately 2.5 meters so there's a limit for actually mounting these telescopes my design involves a frame in the front that can be uh, positioned towards the actual object you want to see so in the front of the telescope that frame you can uh, move the entire optical tube up and down and at the back end of the optical tube you have a system a very complicated mechanism that can be used to actually follow the object so you have a system that can be adjusted in the front and also at the back end so you have two mechanisms to adjust the back end of the telescope is complicated using different uh, mechanisms for adjusting the optical tube and uh, trying to find the object in the night sky and track it so this system is very interesting you have two laminated plates uh, below the tripod and there is the actual movement of this instrument from there you track the object in the sky so these are quite uh, interesting instruments to use because you have to adjust uh, all of these uh, mechanisms and now you see the assembly of this instrument you, you put the telescope on the frame you can uh, remove it and change the actual mount in the front location towards the object you want to see and you bring back the optical tube and position it on the frame under the tripod there are two plates for adjusting left and right backwards and forwards for tracking the object in the night sky it's a very good system with a very strong stability the, there are no vibrations okay zero vibration if you touch the telescope it's just a tiny vibration one second in comparison with huge vibration that lasted almost 20 seconds using a, a single tripod mounting system with a board so it's a good improvement starting from there you can see the instrument the frame for adjusting the height of the optical tube up and down and the tripod for stability and adjusting the uh, back end of the telescope adjusting the uh, fine uh, controls for tracking the objects and you can see how this instrument technique works but you come to the conclusion that this type of mounting system has limits so you can go approximately with a focal length of 2.5 meters maximum load for stability after uh, 2.5 meters long going longer than three meters the optical tube will sag will bend at the middle under its own weight so you need other techniques to stabilize the optical tube using ropes and pulleys and now we we're going to talk about cooling problems 
the cooling of the telescope, the acclimatization process. With long PVC pipe telescopes, this is my first uh, 17th century style telescope in 2012, uh, these instruments have different problems. The PVC pipe is the worst material for constructing this type of telescopes and also cardboard because these instruments at long focal length closed tubes need to cool down and longer the telescope the slowest is the cooling process so you need to find different solutions to this problem solution number one is make the tube larger so if you have a large diameter tube let's say two times bigger than the lens it will cool faster but uh, the problem is that larger the tube the heavier the instrument is and this will also prevent the telescope from bending under its own weight small tube diameters are not good because they are cool slower and can bend under it their own weight because they are small opening tubes and very long and this is a problem because you ended up with uh, deformations and uh, cooling problems so uh, the solution is to make the tube larger than the lens because these lenses are very small and uh, if you have a small lens and a very long focal length it's not quite good this is a telescope made by a canadian amateur astronomer with lenses from tavi's optical made by tavi florian with high quality the tube is very large in diameter and very long for stability and you need a very strong mounting system so this instrument can work but there are some vibrations and uh, a good idea is to mount this telescope on a two-point system for stability Ability. You need a very very strong tripod for this matter to actually cancel these vibrations. The solution is to make the tube larger so if you have a large tube this will prevent the entire OTA from bending and you don't need to worry about uh, deformations if you have a large tube but you need to make a very good uh, lens cell and to align the optics better because it's much harder with larger tubes to align the optics this lens is made by Tavi Florian in Romania and you can see the objective lens in the front is so small in comparison with the diameter of the tube it's a very good solution adopted by this amateur astronomer very good idea another solution is to mount the lenses on a straight board using baffles and uh, the board must be very straight so uh, you need a very very straight board for doing this and uh, the only problem is to align the optics so this is the only solution to this cooling process but a uh, 2.4 meter long tube will not have serious problem if you make it uh, larger than the diameter of the lens these problems come with uh, focal lengths uh, starting from uh, four meters long so you need to adopt an open air design uh, with uh, tubes starting from four meters long because uh, it's very complicated to mount this instrument you if you have a, a single closed tube with four meters long on a two-point system the solution is uh, open air design similar to Hevelius there are only two lenses in the system one single lens in the front and another single lens at the back end the eyepiece so I don't think this telescope has cooling problems also for stability you need to mount this on a Hevelian type of mounting system with ropes and pulleys for stability and the solution is the open air design I don't imagine this type of instrument with a closed tube 21 meters long imagine how long it's going to take to cool down in the hot air to escape from the interior of the tube so that the air inside and the actual air outside will be at the same temperature look at this long telescope in comparison with this working man happy to assemble this monster telescope in my opinion very long uh, focal length closed tube telescopes like this uh, monster doesn't matter the size of the optical tube need to cool down very slow so these were an unwieldy telescope very hard to assemble very hard to cool down and very big 
Small instruments have no cooling problems. Starting from 1 meter going up to 1.5 meter, you don't have huge problems if you make the diameter of the tube, let's say, one time greater than the diameter of the objective lens. If you have a 50 millimeter objective lens, the tube must be 60 millimeters in diameter. So if you use a focal length of 1 meter, there's no problem with that. All of these issues come with the increase of the focal length. So if you have a big uh, focal length telescope, you're gonna have problems if the diameter of the lens is the same as the optical tube, in my case. There are decollimation in the cooling process. So if I take the telescope outside in the cold air and point it to the star, any star, any bright star, you can see this image. Because of the hot air inside, the telescope can cause these problems. Decollimation. Very strange, even if the optical tube is very straight. It takes about 7 minutes for the telescope to cool down and then the, this effect cancels. So the airy disk is not off-center. After 7 minutes, the airy disk is again central in the diffraction ring. Very strange occurrences I have uh, encountered using uh, this long focus refractor on cold weather. So if the outside temperature is 10 degrees and inside is 20 degrees, you're gonna see this difference. So the idea of making the tube the same uh, diameter as the lens is not quite good. Maybe I should go with a larger tube diameter, but this was the only solution for me. I had to drill holes in the optical tube in three places for this instrument to cool down faster. The same problem I have encountered with a long uh, 2.1 meter cardboard tube telescope. The same thing, even if the optics were aligned using a laser collimator, the same thing if I take the telescope outside, it was decollimated. Imagine these telescopes in the 17th century on boards with focal lengths of 4 meters with cardboard tubes. The same problem they had. So because of these issues, they were unable to make discoveries. Also, if you mount the optical tube on a board, the weight of the optical tube can cause problems because of the weight of the entire assembly. The solution is to mount a 4 meter long focus refractor on a very very straight board with baffles and mounting system that involves pulleys and ropes for stability like a Hevelian type telescope. And this is my approach of the 1.8 meter long telescope on a two point system mounting that eliminates all of these problems with the bending and deformation of the optical tube. And uh, folks, now we're going to Walter Stephanie Single Lens Telescopes. I love the craftsmanship of these instruments. Stampani Telescopes, 30 millimeter aperture. Uh, this is the most beautiful instruments I have seen. Very close to Giuseppe Campani style of construction with cardboard tubes and uh, wooden eyepiece holders and uh, wooden lens cells you can see the lens cell made out of wood it's so amazing this instrument is mounted on a board a very straight board that has a curve so it's a very good mounting solution for a 1.6 meter long telescope the maximum solution at its focal length without any problems you can see the eyepiece holders everything is made out of cardboard and uh, the construction style is similar to 17th century telescopes i love it he made uh, other telescopes much larger, very long focal length refractors out of cardboard tubes and uh, imagine the cooling process of these instruments because they are very long. This is a very long 2.7 uh, meter focal length uh, refracting scope made out of cardboard with raw tubes. Mounted on a two point system of course because uh, it's too long to mount it on a tripod with a wooden uh, straight board. But this setup can be used with two-point system. You can see Stephanie approach, a very good idea. 
Imagine the cooling process of this instrument in cold weather because I have the same problem with my 2.1 meter cardboard tube instrument that had many uh, tubes like this with an inside diameter of 50 millimeters, much larger than the objective lens. So still I have the same problem. Look at these uh, telescopes at Museo Galileo made by Giuseppe Campani, Eustachio Divini and other telescope makers in the 17th century. This is a Keplerian telescope, a very long focus, wooden instrument, octagonal design, refurbished from the 17th century, very large instrument. It's a draw tube telescope. This is another Eustachio de Vini refracting scope, very long instrument, 5 meters long with draw tubes. Imagine the size of this instrument and uh, it's quite complicated because uh, you need a very strong uh, system to actually mount these telescopes because they are very long so they are very sensitive to bending so a two-point system mount and the board underneath this instrument is ideal to mount them and use them it, it was the only way larger than four meter focal lengths you need a system similar to Hevelius with uh, ropes and pulleys to actually stabilize the optical tube and prevent it from bending and curving under its own weight. A board underneath is uh, very ideal for these kinds of draw tube style instruments. Look, You can see how long they are. That big telescope in the middle it's made by probably Giuseppe Campani, a very long 10 meter focus telescope. This is a 1.8 meter long Italian Venetian single lens telescope from the middle of 17th century very long instruments and now we're going to talk about Richard Barry single lens refractor this is a four meter long telescope made by Richard a 60 millimeter diameter a very long focus refractor and I can see he implemented the Hevelius idea with ropes and the two-point system one in the middle and one in the back the back system can be raised up and lowered so you can adjust the height of the telescope and move left and right it's a very huge instrument made with uh, wooden planks joined together the diameter of the tube is quite large it's uh, probably two times bigger than the lens it's a square tube design you can see photos made by Richard himself with his telescope the moon the craters of the moon these are black and white photos quite impressive from that uh, time and uh, probably the optics are made by Richard himself uh, the objective lens and eyepieces used for observing you can see planet Venus with this very long telescope and now we're going to talk about hidden details you missed in this video from Bellevue Kaisel telescopes in Germany. Now look at these images. You can see this uh, 17th century, probably at the beginning of the 18th century, uh, a telescope mounted on the rooftop. But look left, you can see an aerial objective lens on a pillar. You can see the pillar and the objective lens the housing of the objective lens and the solid tube telescopes on the terrace. There are two instruments here. You probably missed the aerial telescope and the pillar. You can see the ropes for uh, adjusting the objective lens height, the lens cell. And you can see up close here the lens cell. You can see the middle part, the assembly, you can move this uh, lens uh, left and right, up and down, and you can see the actual objective lens here in the present day, 180 millimeters in diameter, and this objective lens is the exact objective you saw in that illustration. You can see the objective lens in the right, at the bottom the eyepiece and the left the box for the objective lens. This is a multi diaphragm objective lens with an aperture of 180. It goes up to 100 millimeters in diameter and the focal length is 32 meters long. You can see the inside of the lens cell and the diaphragms it's a quite a remarkable piece of craftsmanship. The biconvex symmetric lens, it's quite impressive, made from cardboard with multi diaphragms and a box of this uh, lens cell. You can see the original box for keeping the objective. And the eyepiece, 85 millimeters in diameter, used at 50 millimeters. I don't know the focal length of the eyepiece. 
and you can see how large the eyepiece looks in your hand you can actually see the comparison of the eyepiece it's a huge eyepiece quite a remarkable I think it's a Huygens design and you can see the solid tube telescope on the terrace and this telescope exists today you can see the illustration and the actual instrument in the present day a 9 centimeter objective lens with a 4.5 meter focal length I think the objective lens is reduced at 55 millimeters aperture 9 centimeter is too big for a huge 4.5 meter long telescope and this system was used with uh, ropes and pulleys to actually stabilize the tube you can see the wonderful craftsmanship of the objective lens housing it's an octagonal tube design and the eyepiece uh, look at the craftsmanship uh, this was probably refurbished in the present day it's a nice instrument I think uh, it was made by Giuseppe Campani now we're going to talk about hard soccer lenses and you can see this illustration you probably messed up the aerial objective lens mounting on that pillar you can see a solid telescope or solid tube design but on top you can see an objective lens housing and a mounting for an aerial telescope at the bottom left people with magnifying glasses in their hands with magnifying lenses eyepieces Kepler design holding in their hands and observing the moon with that objective lens you can see the 50 feet objective lens made by Hartzoker a large objective lens for an aerial telescope probably that aerial telescope in that illustration you can see other lenses made by Hartzoker good quality for different instruments solid tube telescopes and aerial instruments and this is a the actual 50 feet objective lens housed at the Leiden observatory quite a remarkable piece of uh, lens Hevelius instruments we're going to talk about uh, some telescopes that are believed to be made by Hevelius a uh, 5.2 centimeter telescope with a focal length of 4.3 meters long look at this description about this instrument You can see the telescope that six magnification is probably an error because uh, you cannot build a huge instrument like this and uh, expect a six magnification there are two point system mounting one in the front and one in the back you can see the tube being curved because of this very rudimentary type of mounting system for that very long focus refractor even if you made the tubes from iron or other materials it will still bend because the focal length is too large for this type of mounting system you need ropes and pulleys to actually stabilize and uh, prevent the tube from actually bending under its own weight at the middle so the problem is at the middle of the instrument very long focus objective lenses attributed to Hevelius probably uh, never used by Hevelius or lost uh, found in uh, Danzig. This is the description of the lenses. Many of different uh, historians believe that the big lens was used with a 45 meter long telescope but the focal length is different. These are very nice lenses made by an optician, not Hevelius, probably Hevelius never made lenses. He actually supplied them and uh, probably bought them from an optician. These are models of uh, Hevelius telescopes. I mentioned that the lenses came from someone else the actual instruments were made by Hevelius and his workmen these are large instruments and this is a very nice copy of the observatory he used quite a showpiece of Europe at that uh, 
time. This observatory has a very sad fate. The building burned in, at a big fire in Danzig and all of the instruments was lost. Probably some of them escape because uh, in that time astronomers can uh, sell instruments or other astronomers I have this idea, I bought some of the lenses uh, from Hevelius. They were exchanging optical instruments uh, like today, so probably those lenses were purchased by someone from Hevelius. And now we're going to talk about Giuseppe Campani 30mm 1.8m focal length single lens refracting scope. You can see the objective lens is made out of olive wood and looks very interesting with multiple screws and uh, it's screwed into the optical tube and he had uh, holes for, um, for actually mounting the lens cell and attaching it with screws to the OTA like today standards. You can see the beautiful objective lens made by Giuseppe Campani. I really love the craftsmanship of this lens. Grinded at the uh, edge, it looks very nice. These were very skilled opticians, like Giuseppe Campani or Stacchio Divini. I don't know how they made these lenses, so the actual process is probably known, but the techniques of grinding, polishing, the movements of the hands at the polishing stage, grinding stage, uh, the testing of these lenses was, in a sense, lost and uh, many of these opticians kept their secrets to the grave so no one will understand how they made these lenses even today no one knows how these opticians achieve making these objective lenses eyepieces and other components the construction of the telescope is known but the lenses even today no one knows how they did it test them and uh, actually make them using uh, different optical processes no one knows how these lenses were tested, so there are different theories, but uh, they are still theories, so uh, it's good to theorize, but you don't have no evidence. All of the evidence was lost, so in a sense, uh, we stick around uh, with theories of how these objective lenses were made. But the craftsmanship of these lenses is wonderful. I really love how these opticians uh, obtained such lenses. You can see a schematic of the whole telescope. This is a terrestrial instrument. The objective lens is much larger and reduced at 30 millimeters. It's a very long focal length. The optics is very good for this lens. You can see the parts of the eyepiece at the bottom and the whole telescope above. The actual objective lens has a diameter of 47 millimeters and with the aperture mask at the lens cell, you can see the lens cell and the actual objective lens mounted inside, it reduces at 30 millimeters in diameter. Also the eyepiece has an aperture mask to reduce the aberrations and the defects of the lens at the edge. I really love the craftsmanship of the eyepieces exterior. And you can see the whole instrument here. A draw tube design, 1.8 meter long focal length. And this instrument you see in this image is the actual instrument that man is observing with. This whole telescope is mounted on a board, a straight board, and attached to a very tiny tripod. You can see the fragile tripod. It's a very unstable instrument because of the long focal length, but also the weight of the tube and the board. So the vibrations caused by this uh, mounting system, it's very high. It, it is very difficult to observe with this instrument at this very long focal length. So that telescope in that image, which uh, that uh, optician or scientist was observing with is the same telescope here in this image. I really love the decorations of the optical tube. These draw tube telescopes have eyepiece and objective lens caps to protect them from dust. I really love the caps made from the same wood. The decorations of the optical tube at the exterior part are very nicely done. A very artistic telescope. It's so nice to have this instrument in your collection. To Even to add an instrument like this in your collection or for just decoration purpose it's very nice it's a very attractive instrument but uh, observing with it's a totally different thing to actually observe with a telescope 300 years old it's quite remarkable 
you can see the description of the actual instrument, the tubes and the objective lens cell. And now we're going to switch to another objective lens made by Giuseppe Campani, a 44mm aperture, 4.3 meters long telescope. You can see the actual data for this objective lens. This is the actual lens. All of those images and data were sent to me by Yuri Petrunin. The actual objective lens, it's nicely done. You can see the name Giuseppe Campani signed at the edge of the glass. All of major opticians in the 17th century like to sign their name on the objective lens. The lens is much larger and only the middle part is used 44 millimeters in diameter with a 4.3 meters long focal length. So the tube must have a 4.3 meter long uh, length for this telescope. You can see the actual edge of the lens being nicely grinded. The weight of the objective lens The aperture mask, 44 millimeters in diameter, this was a lens used in the beginning of the 18th century. You can see the aperture mask, different aperture masks, so the inner one 44 millimeters and another larger diameter, probably for faint objects. This is an optical test of this instrument. You can see the actual quality of the lens. Mm, let's say it's like uh, it's a good quality but intermediate, not very very high quality lens it's very good for its purpose you can see a psf map the simulations of the airy disc so this is probably how stars will look throughout this instrument the quality it's kind of mediocre but it's good for a 17th century telescope not all lenses were perfect okay some of them were very perfect some of them not too good like today's standards now please watch this video. Telescopes had to undergo a dramatic evolution. Back in the 1650s, the first step in this evolution was going to great lengths, quite literally. Telescopes became very long, 15, 20 feet. The problem with early telescopes was fuzzy images. The reason, the shape of the lens. As NASA astrophysicist Kim Weaver demonstrates, when a strongly curved lens bends or refracts beams of light, the light doesn't all come to a single point. First of all, the different beams of light don't line up, and so the image that you get with this lens would be really fuzzy. Also, some of the light has its colors split out, and that distorts the image. The only way to minimize the blurriness and the rainbow colors is to use thinner lenses with a shallower curve. Because the light comes to a focus further from the lens, refracting telescopes get longer and get greater magnification. 17th century astronomers make ever thinner lenses and space them further apart. By about 1660, telescopes have magnified 50 or 100 times, uh, and those lengths increased and increased and increased. This is the first space race. On the quest to see ever further, telescopes reach absurd proportions, up to 150 feet in length, half the length of a football field. These unwieldy telescopes are better, but astronomers want to see even more detail. And these telescopes don't eliminate the rainbow colors altogether. And now we're going to talk about Huygens lenses. And these are some of the objective lenses and eyepiece lenses at Borhave Museum in Leiden. You can see these lenses are huge for aerial telescopes uh, without optical tubes and even solid tube telescopes. All of these lenses are made by Huygens. He designs different uh, machines for semi-automatic lens grinding and polishing. So even machines for uh, actually making these lenses were designed. Even Giuseppe Campani used these machines to actually grind and polish lenses. 
the only surviving instrument made by Huygens has a focal length of almost 4 meters long, approximately 3.9 meters and a diameter of 6.7 centimeters using a biconvex objective lens with a magnification of about 49 times. The tubes are iron plated, draw tubes design. These instruments were tiny compared to the other telescopes made by Huygens. This is almost a 4 meter long telescope, but imagine other telescopes much larger than this going up to 5 meters, 6 meters, 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters long. So the actual tube design is not going to work, it, it's flawless at its length, so Huygens designed an aerial telescope without a optical tube using an objective lens mounted on a pole with a mount connected to a string to the eyepiece. The eyepiece can be holded in your hands so you can hold the eyepiece or you can have a mounting system, a tripod or something to have the eyepiece aligned. A string connects both uh, optical elements for aligning and it's a very difficult system to align. You move the objective lens by pushing the string up and down so you can actually align the lenses. It's very hard to use this instrument. It's very complicated to align to stars. B the moon, planets, even those objects are difficult so I don't know how they prefer this method but uh, even this instrument can be used for observations and in the 17th century it was still used in even Cassini used and make discoveries such as the moons of Saturn with this type of instrument. Now we're going to talk about lens making techniques in the 17th century. Optical surfaces are polished by abrasion. Polishing was initially by hand. Later the optical lathe was developed which, in its basic structure, is still used in lens making today. The so-called air lathe, used in Murano and Venice in the early 17th century, was activated by a flywheel, rotated by the craftsman with a handle. Around the flywheel was placed a belt or rope that transmitted the motion to the horizontal lathe axle overhead. A mud-soaked rag or resinous material was fastened to a round plate at the end of the axle. The craftsman brought the glass up to the plate and polished the surface by pressing it down. The Florentine craftsman, Ippolito Francini, is credited for turning the air lathe into the present-day optical lathe, with a vertical axis. This modification gives the operator far greater control of the glass during the process and yields smoother, more regularly shaped surfaces. Other innovative lathes were devised in the second half of the 17th century. A lathe by Campani in Rome with a horizontal axle and a long pressing rod that moves the glass and keeps it at the desired curvature. A lathe described by Cherubin de Hollande, similar to Campani's but with a vertical axle, and a hook's lathe with a vertical axle and an inclined revolving rod. Now we're going to talk about the construction of my telescope, 34 millimeters in diameter, 1.8 meter long. All of this project began with the purchasing of the objective lens made by Tavi Florian, a very good quality lens, plate glass, soda lime, window glass selected with uh, high precision for the most highest quality soda lime glass, so the glass has no defects inside, just perfect. I selected a, and bought a uh, copper tube, 42 millimeters in diameter, the same diameter as the lens, for easy attachment to the optical tube. A simple solution for mounting the objective lens. You can see the cell for the lens made out of two fitting copper adapters to fit the lens to the optical tube. It's a very simple mounting system. I selected because I don't have uh, resources for making a proper lens cell for a larger optical tube. So this OTA is very good. You can see the whole OTA, the optical tube for short, and the eyepiece, the actual eyepiece holder for the eyepieces. The eyepiece is just a simple focusing mechanism, just move the eyepiece backwards and forwards in the 
actual adapter. This is the lens cell attachment fitting, a larger fitting, so the lens will sit inside, resting on the edge of the optical tube in the front, so the optical tube is perfectly leveled in the front. You can see an image inside the optical tube without baffles inside. And now we're taking a look at the baffles, all made from PVC pipe with an interior diameter of 35 millimeters. All of them were grinded inside and sanded, so there are no reflections and the paint will stick better if there were no reflections and they are grinded inside. Look at the actual lens cell attached. So I completed the lens cell here for the objective lens. Look at the image of the interior of the tube and then the baffles. You can see the baffles ready for painting after grinding inside to eliminate uh, reflections. So the painting process is very nicely done, very easy. The whole diaphragms or baffles will stick inside using a board. So I use the board to stick them inside and you can see a baffle here uh, ready for installation. You can see another image with uh, wrapping of the baffles with uh, a special tape to fit them harder inside so they will go into the optical tube much harder for resistance in case of falling them so even uh, the actual diameter of the baffles were tiny so they will play inside the optical tube so I need to tape them with a special tape and then I fit them inside it was a very difficult process actually two hours two and a half hours of uh, installation of these baffles it was a very hard because there are so many you can see the process of installation taking about two and a half hours a very long and difficult process a time-consuming process of installing all of these baffles in the optical tube. You can see I've inserted almost uh, half of the baffles and now all of them, the reflections are completely, and now the optical tube with all of the baffles inside, the reflections are completely eliminated from the actual tube. And now the whole completed diaphragms or baffles inside attached you can see the baffles, it's a huge amount of uh, tubes inside the OTA, almost 18 baffles inside. It was a very cheap solution. You can see here the mounting of the optical tube after the completion of the baffle installation. This is the AQ1 mount that I'm attaching. The optical tube is sitting on a board. The problem is that the mounting system is not good, so I needed another system of holding the optical tube. The OT is small in diameter, so fitting them on a tripod is not good. So a two-point mounting system is perfect for this type of instrument at this focal length. The vibrations and deformations are cancelled with this type of mounting system. I really love it and all of the problems of the deformations and the uh, temperature changes caused by the cold weather on the type of uh, tripod mounting had been cancelled. Another problem persists, the cooling problem because it's a tiny tube and uh, it's very hard to actually cool down, it takes a much longer period for cooling down. I drilled some holes in the optical tube to make sure that uh, it will cool faster. So all of these problems are cancelled and this type of mounting system can sustain telescopes up to 2.5 meters, in some cases 3 meters, but uh, you need the optical tube to be much bigger than the lens used at the objective. So. Uh, a 50 millimeter lens will need a tube about 60 or 65 even 70 millimeters in diameter with a focal length of 3 meters to actually work on this uh, frame two-point mounting system but the longer the tube will be difficult to actually sustain a telescope and the long focal length will induce much more vibrations even with this type of mounting system so you need the ropes and pulleys a pillar in the middle of the courtyard to actually mount this telescope at a focal length of four meters long so 
this method has limits, okay? But uh, trying to adjust uh, two systems, one in the front and one in the back, it's, it's much more complicated than mounting a telescope on a tripod and moving uh, freely with your hands. You need to adjust two points, two mounting systems. So this type of mounting system is kind of uh, strange, but you get used to it over time. You cannot make systematic observations with this mounting system. It simply doesn't work like this. So uh, trying to find objects in the night sky using a finder scope, it's kind of tricky because the frame is sitting right in the field of view of the finder scope. So you need uh, another method to attach the finder scope to be much higher so it doesn't uh, came in the frame field of view. So it's going to be complications with this type of mounting system, but it's good for bright double stars. It's not going to work on very uh, dim double stars, only bright double stars, planets, the moon, the sun, so bright objects you can visualize with this type of mounting system. You're not going to make systematic observations trying to find deep sky objects or stuff like that. No, it's, uh, it's much more harder than uh, a simple equatorial mounting system. So this is it, my fellas, the actual end of this presentation. I thank you all for watching it. Over time I'm going to make other videos and update you about uh, my progress with these instruments and other types of updates in this field of view. I thank you all and have clear skies.